There exists a hidden world of microorganisms beyond what we can see with our unaided eyes. Over a hundred years ago, this world was discovered through the progress of science. It was a huge leap forward for mankind. Scientific medicine came to understand how germs cause disease. We washed our hands, sterilized surgery, and created vaccines, antibiotics, and drugs that work. Life expectancy doubled in less than 50 years. But now the happy story starts to falter. Today a war is being fought against reason. Science is treated with suspicion, perhaps born of fear, and medical advance is challenged by the march of irrational belief. A third of us now spend over 1.6 billion pounds a year on superstitious alternative remedies which, as far as the evidence can show, don't work. Okay. Yep. Good. Have you asked any angels to come close to you? No. No, well you haven't got any then. If any remedy is tested under controlled scientific conditions and proved to be effective, it will cease to be alternative and will simply become medicine. So-called alternative medicine either hasn't been tested or it has failed its tests. There wasn't a control, it was just an outcome. It was just, it was just a pilot study. Right. So that's not really a no, proper, no. proper trial. And some alternatives are funded by us taxpayers, even though their unproven claims question the known laws of physics. You, know, you might think I'm gulling the patient. I don't claim that it's much more than a hypothesis. What I do say is that I have quite considerable evidence that homeopathy does work, and I'm sure that it's safe. Today, while we indulge unproven healing magic, tried and tested scientific medicine is under attack. In this program, I want to look at how health has become a battleground between reason and superstition. <sighs> you come here to move through time and through space. Allow the eyes to gently close. Smile your very best smile. Swallow the smile with some saliva into the heart and let the heart smile back at you. And there's a warm and a welcoming feeling. Joy without end. Grace, beauty, laughter. The deep knowing of the wise being that you are. And the golden glow that comes from the heart comes from a golden flower. And use the gold light from the centre of the flower like a sunbeam and beam it onto those petals and wake them up. There is a second part that's very personal. And this is to step inside the pearl itself. Because if you step inside the pearl, you could find out who you are. Elisis Livingstone is a professional faith healer. She runs the Shambhala Retreat in Glastonbury. For £140 a day, she treats patients, including those with terminal cancer, with a mix of meditation, spiritual healing, and the playing of recorded chants. She believes she can alter the structure of DNA. Quite an experience. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. DNA is very interesting right now in our, the evolution of the human race. Um, every human being, except um, a very small percentage, has a double helix in the cell. We and don't all have. Oh, everyone. You said a very small percentage. Oh, no, a very small percentage do not. Really? They have got more strands. Um, we used to have in Atlantis 12 strands, and they're in the form of four triangles facing in, in each cell. And we forgot who we were in the experiment after Atlantis, mm -hmm. and everything changed. Reincarnation was introduced. The soul I know what you're thinking. This woman is way out. I expected a serious program about the attack on science, and here's Richard Dawkins just picking on an easy target. But these ideas are not so weird in the irrational world of alternative health. In fact, they're commonplace. 
Is Elise's theory of DNA from Atlantis any more irrational than the Ayurvedic notion of chakras, seven spinning energy wheels inside us? They're certainly great money spinners. How do we know all this? Where, where does all this come from? Um, it comes from the Akashic record, the record of all vibration on this planet. Uh, we also have knowing. In, when we were doing the heart meditation, you go into the deep knowing. And the deep knowing, it really can't be argued. What you know, I know that you realise this, of course, you know. Well, I, I, I know that DNA is a double helix, but that's only been known since 1953. How is her evidence, the knowing of this Akashic record, any worse than the evidence for homeopathic claims that the more you dilute an active ingredient, the more effective it becomes? Both depend on faith. ...for all things and all activations of spirit. Apparently, I'm only a few DNA strands short of the full Atlantean quota. Elisis kindly agrees to top me up. So, let's put the last triangle in. And it's done. <laughs> Let me know in six months how you're feeling. I'll, 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 I'll wait and see if I get any any, yes, any, any effects. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not all wacky, quacky fun. Today, alternative or rather unproven remedies are fast becoming mainstream implicitly casting doubt on scientific medicine. Surveys reveal that a third of us spend an incredible 1.6 billion pounds a year on the kind of therapeutic stabs in the dark touted here in Glastonbury. It's mostly angels. I want to find out why such superstitious nonsense is mounting a growing challenge to scientific medicine. Once, society exalted scientists as heroes. Their insights fuel tangible progress, from clean water to networked computing, self-evident benefits that we now take for granted. Yet, as science has moved on, it's become more complex and difficult to grasp. It's easier to portray scientists as the people who bring us Frankenstein food, pollute the environment, or conduct sinister experiments on defenseless little animals. In the war being fought against reason, even medicine is now under attack. Media cause célèbre, from side effects to superbugs, have bred widespread cynicism about medical progress. So much so, that in 1998, the publicizing of one survey of 12 children that wrongly linked MMR vaccine with autism prompted hundreds of thousands of parents to opt their children out of entirely sensible inoculations. A hyped-up insinuation that the government and the medical establishment were conspiring to sacrifice our next generation to autism has left up to a fifth of our children entirely unprotected against rubella, mumps and measles, a disease with complications such as brain injury and deafness. This is what measles looks like, a potentially fatal illness now in... The number of parents inoculating their children with MMR quickly fell. There have now been epidemics in Kent and Yorkshire and a first death from measles in 14 years. Now everybody's more confused, it muddies the water, it's frightening. See the boy on the telly in there. It's an acute example of the danger of devaluing evidence. Where once there was reason, now there is confusion. One of the things that struck me right from the outset 
was how extraordinary it was that this scare got abroad when there were, it was so insubstantial. I mean, there was really no scientific basis for it whatsoever. I find it very easy to sympathise with patients who were scared, partly because the media built it up, but also because having your child vaccinated is a positive act. It's something that you did to the child. And so somehow that's, that's more scary than, than, than a sin of omission. Very much, and I think that's even more the case these days when people are much less familiar with the diseases against which their children have been protected by immunisation. You know, it's a, a generation or two since people had much experience of measles and mumps and rubella on any significant scale. And so when somebody comes along and says, well, 